We all know that time is our most valuable resource, but what if the secret to making the most of it isn't about time management at all? Today, we're going to uncover the powerful distinction between time and energy and how understanding it can transform every aspect of your life. Time is just chronological, right? Everyone has the same amount. Energy is a fluctuating quality. If you don't understand the difference between the two, you're going to struggle in your life. We will also dive into why being present isn't just about the time spent, but the energy you bring. You can be present for an hour and actually be dedicating no energy towards that one hour versus truly being there. It makes an enormous, enormous difference. So 15 minutes of true energy can be hours worth of time. And it's not just about how you use your time alone. Who you spend it with can define your entire life. How important is it to spend time with the right people? It's the difference between a good life and a bad life. There is scientific evidence that shows that the people that you surround yourself with, the people that create your environment, are going to shape your outcomes and your reality. I'm Chris Hutchins, and today we're going to dive into so many incredible tactics you can use. Big favor before we jump in is to give us a quick thumbs up to help others find this channel. And if you're new here and you want to keep upgrading your life, money, and travel, consider subscribing. You've said that people who don't understand the difference between time and energy are really going to struggle with relationships. What do you mean by that? Well, time and energy are just fundamentally not the same thing. And so few people realize this. Really, time is just chronological, right? It's, everyone has the same amount. Energy is a fluctuating quality. And if you don't understand the difference between the two, you're going to struggle in your life because you can be present with someone or you can be present with yourself for an hour and actually be dedicating no energy towards that one hour. If you're sitting on your phone, if you're multitasking, if you're all over texts, email, whatever, versus truly being there with the other person or truly being in a space of solitude on your own, it makes an enormous, enormous difference. So 15 minutes of true energy can be hours worth of time. And you've put together a great post about how people spend time. Are there things that you realized about time that made this more important? Yeah, there are just specific windows of time, both on a kind of like macro scale in your life, years, windows, and micro windows, you know, like 15 minutes here or there during the course of your day that just have a more important quality to them. And that realization is a really powerful one. The, the ancient Greeks actually had two words for time. They had chronos, uh, which is sort of chronological time. And then they had kairos, which is this more like qualitative idea of time that certain moments have a higher level of import uh, to them. And that idea, like that distinction is a really, really important one, because then what you can say is, Energy deployed into those specific moments or windows has a much higher return. It has a much higher leverage. And you see that in all areas of life once you've kind of identified that idea, right? Like specific athletes, um, uh, you know, in like warriors and historical culture and in, um, you know, in things that you've read about in history, um, politicians, like all of these people you read about, what you realize is they deployed their energy into a very specific moment of time that had that nature, that that Kairos nature to it. And that's why it was amplified to the level that we read about it today. Yeah. And then a, a bit more macro. I remember you made this post uh, somewhere at some point about, you know, there's a window of time for family. There's a window of time for children. Does that kind of create goals for how you spend your time at, at, at a much bigger scale? Yeah, your life has seasons. And what you prioritize and focus on during any one season um, fluctuates and differs, right? Like during your early 20s, that's a season uh, when you are uniquely well set up to build a financial foundation for the rest of your life. And people who spend that time and do that uh, generally are set up pretty nicely in their 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, similarly, oftentimes your thirties and forties are kind of your family building season for a lot of people. That's when your kids are young. That's when you have a new relationship, a partner, whatever it might be. That's also when you have aging parents that you're wanting to spend that time with. And so it, what it means to me at least is identifying those seasons for what they are 
and identifying how short those windows of time are that these different things need to be prioritized in your life. And when you do that, that's where you find the gold. Yeah. Yeah. I think the biggest one for me was when we talked about kids and how, you know, how much time we spend with them. And you put up this chart that was like time spent with children. And it's like, there's a very finite window of when that exists. And, and similarly, when you think about your family, your parents, like you basically use all of that really early. So if you want to recreate it, you have to be really intentional. Whereas you get plenty of time by yourself <laughs> as you age. And so just jumping through some of those charts, we'll link to the posts in the show notes. Just made me yeah. think, what do I want to do right now in my life? Especially when the time my kids want to hang out with me is kind of really peaking. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're... There is a 10 year window when you are your child's entire world. And after that, they have other people who fill those roles. They have best friends, they have partners, spouses, um, you know, girlfriends, boyfriends, whatever. Uh, but during that 10 year window, there's this really special time where you really occupy this enormous uh full front and center role in your child's life. And so recognizing that as you're in it or even before it is what's important because it's going to pass. And what you don't want to do is have it pass and then say, oh, crap, I wish I had really taken advantage of those moments back then. And that's what happens to most people because life accelerates on us, right? You get responsibilities, there's kids, there's mortgages, there's all these things like, you know, time flies. It's the common saying. It's a common saying because it happens and people feel that. And so it's really just the recognition now today of those special windows of time so that you can be present in them and not allow it to just accelerate and disappear. I just did this recent episode on making time, but if we talk a little bit about being more intentional about it, you can be intentional about the time you have alone and you can be intentional about the time you have with others. I'm gonna kind of split this conversation up into those two buckets and start with the time we spend by ourselves. And I think a lot of us, often think, oh, I have some free time. I'm by myself. Let's check all this stuff off my list. You have an anti-to-do list, which I think is kind of total counter to how the average person might think about time. How does that work? And, and how do you suggest people use something like that? What I found personally was um, a to-do list was great. And I kind of knew what I needed to address. And I normally try to keep my to-do list onto like a I'll just hold it up like a little three by five note card because um, it prevents me from having the like 800 item to do list of like low priority things. So I really just focus on the three to five most important things. But there's all these things in my life that I'm trying to get better at, trying to avoid bad habits, whatever it might be. So I had a system for doing the good things that I wanted to do, but not a system in place for avoiding the bad things that I wanted to stay away from. And so the anti to do list um, is a system for doing just that. It's for avoiding those, you know, places where you know you're going to die. To paraphrase, to paraphrase uh, Charlie Munger, uh, you know, all I want to know is where I'm going to die, so I never go there. These are the places where you're going to die, metaphorically, and you're trying to avoid them. So you literally make a list, and ideally keep it front and center on a daily basis of the three to five things that you're trying to avoid. So for me, an example would be um, having my phone out in front of my son. Um, I'm still terrible about this and I'm working on getting better at it. So on a daily basis, having that in front of me is something that I want to avoid is a reminder. It's like um, bringing it into your conscious mind so that you know that in the moment when I do have my phone in front of my son, he's trying to play with me. I say like, OK, I can flip a switch. Oh, that's something that I'm trying to avoid. Let me put this down. Um, so that's the idea. It's like have those things top uh, top of mind so that they don't just become a bad habit that perpetuates in your world. And do they have to be just kind of personal things or can this be a, a work anti to do list also? No, I mean, I have work items on mine. So that's a personal one. Um, one of the most common work ones that I'll have on mine is not grazing on low value tasks. Um, so what I mean by that is I have a tendency to like sit around and if I have a free block of time, I'll just kind of lazily do email for like an hour rather than focusing on the one priority item that's really going to move the needle and drive things forward. And um, avoiding that grazing has been a key to me unlocking my real productivity. And especially post kids when, again, to your point on your prior conversation that you had on making time, um, that's a real way to make time is if you stop grazing for two hours on those low priority tasks, all of a sudden you Parkinson's law 
you know, work expands to fill the time allotted for its completion, you can get that work done in 30 minutes. Now I have an hour and a half that just got created and I can spend that in the pool with my son. I can spend that on the high priority tasks, whatever it might be that I want to reallocate that into. We covered this in, uh, in my past episode and we called it the infinity pools. Cause like you could spend as much time as you want on these things and just get totally sucked into it. But infinity pools. I really like that. That's a good, uh, it's a good framing for it. Yeah. And so do you check these things off as you kind of get through a day and say, I nailed it. Good job. Or how do you reinforce this other than just writing them down? Yeah. What I found is that if you treat it like your actual to-do list for a week, where you're actually checking the item or crossing it off your list, it then becomes second nature. Um, and you don't need to physically cross the thing off. Some people like the physical feeling of crossing at the end of the day, like the feeling of accomplishment, the little dopamine hit you get from that. Um, so I've seen people who do like to continue crossing it off the list. For me personally, the list changes. So an anti-to-do list, um, similar to, to a to-do list will change. As you as you get really good about certain items on this list, it doesn't need to just stay there, right? If you haven't uh, had your phone out in front of your kid for six months because it's now a habit and you know not to do that, then that can get replaced by something else that you're trying to avoid. You talked earlier about really focusing the time you spend on the things that are the most important. You shared this Zen parable about how long it takes to do something and how maybe the amount of focus you have isn't how you get the highest effect. Talk a little bit about that and the law of reversed effort. This is one of my favorite ones. Um, did you ever read Brave New World? I did not. Oh, maybe I did, actually. Maybe. Yeah, it's dystopian novel. Um amazing book written by this guy, Aldous Huxley. Um, and Aldous Huxley has this quote. He says, the harder we try with the conscious will to do something, the less we shall succeed. And that's the idea that underlies the law of reversed effort. It's like you're in a swimming pool and the more furiously you try to swim, the more you actually tend to sink versus just kind of going with the flow and being easy and, and, uh, and effortless. It relates to athletics in a lot of ways. So it sort of naturally clicked in my mind that way where um, sprinters follow what they call the 80% rule. When they run at an 80% intensity or perceived effort level, they run faster than if they try to run at 100% intensity. Because when you run at 100% intensity, you tense up your whole body, your jaw clenches and everything gets less fluid. The same thing applies to any of your endeavors in your life. And you've probably experienced that and felt that. The harder you push, the harder you look, the harder you strain, the less the outcomes actually follow. When you ease up a little bit, when you slow down to speed up, you actually start to experience the gains and the progress that you were looking for in the first place. Yeah. I mean, the other night I was like, I just need to go to sleep. And I just remember I'm like, you know, that moment where you're like trying to go to sleep, oh. it's absolutely the worst. I always use that as an example with this because it's so common. The other one that's really common is relationships. I mean, everyone has faced a time in their life where they were like looking for that perfect person, just like pushing, looking over and over again. And it tends to be that when you stop looking for the thing, it comes to you. There's this quote that I love, don't chase butterflies, mend your garden and the butterflies will come. Uh, and I've always loved that. It's like a beautiful way of thinking about it, that if you just focus yourself internally and on how you're building yourself, then the things that you want in life come to you. Yeah, I mean, I guess one of the ways that you could do that, Bill Gates does his think week, you propose a think day. Does that help you kind of focus those internal thoughts? Yeah, Bill Gates, I mean, this is, I think this probably goes back to like the 1990s for him, maybe even the 1980s. Um, you know, he used to go off the grid for an entire week and just read and think. And the whole idea was to get out of the day to day of building this company and all these hundreds of employees and all of this stuff and just create space in your life to think. We rarely have that in our lives and we rarely have that before kids. We certainly rarely have it after kids. Um, and when you're in your professional life, what happens is you kind of get into this daily momentum of here's what I do every single day. And I'm just going to continue pushing on that and doing all of these things. Um, and escaping that by creating the space in your life is important, but most of us can't take a week to go do that. And so the think day, which is kind of like my adaptation of it, which is once a month or once a quarter, if you can't swing once a month, take a day where you're just going to spend time thinking about some of the bigger picture things 
I think of it in your professional life, but it can be your personal life as well. Um, asking yourself, kind of going through question prompts to push on some of the underlying assumptions you have about your personal or professional life, the most important things that you need to be focusing on that are really going to drive you forward. Just slowing down and creating that space tends to be where you then find those sort of asymmetric opportunities that are the ones that, in hindsight, have vaulted you to the next level of whatever your endeavor is. When I first thought about this, I thought, okay, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to look at my to-do list, I'm going to crank through things, and this is the exact opposite of that. So, or at least that's my, my interpretation. How do you start to structure that, you know, those prompts or those thoughts? Many of us just default to this mode of, I have this massive list of things to do, so if I'm going to block off a day, it's really hard to get into that flow. Yeah, I think there's a few. I mean, I had a list of like six questions that I like to ask myself. We can put them some of them in the show notes. The really key thing here is that you need to get out of your normal mode of thinking on the problems that you're facing. So let's talk about it professionally. Um, the traditional way that you're going to think about this is you go and you're going to sit down, and you're going to try to crank through work the whole day. That's like, hey, I'm just in the normal mindset. I just happen to be in a different place. What you want to do is snap yourself out of that. So I always find one of the most useful ways to think about that is um, what are some uh, core beliefs that I have or assumptions that I have um, that may not be true? It's like the Mark Twain. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. What do you know for sure that just ain't so? Like if you were to find out a year from now that something you fundamentally believe to be true about your business or about your career uh, is not true, why wasn't it true? And what were you missing? How were you missing that? And how might it inform how you're actually doing things on a daily basis? The other one I absolutely love is from Tim Ferriss via, I think, Newt Gingrich, uh, the politician, uh, which is, where am I hunting uh, field mice instead of antelope. And the idea is like hunting field mice is like these tiny little critters running around versus the antelope, which are the big game that you should really be focusing on. And so it's asking yourself these handful of sort of big picture thinking questions to get yourself out of your comfort zone, to get yourself to question some of the underlying assumptions that you have about what's driving you forward and just spark that internal dialogue and creativity. Yeah, for me, when you said that first prompt, what just crossed my mind is, I don't think this is going to be true, but is there a world where all that's been happening with AI kind of is able to take a podcast, summarize it into tactics, get rid of the, the host, get rid of the ad reads, and like people just no longer listen? And if that future does exist, what kinds of things could we be building around that? Which is totally different from... You know, I have this wall in our office with like all these episodes, like, here's what we're going to do next week. Here's what we're going to do that week. You know, that would be one thought. And the other is like, what if all of this doesn't matter and we need to build a system for people to use some tool to get around the fact that AI summarizes everything? I don't know. That, that's one that, as you said that, I was like, I should spend some time thinking about what that world would look like. Yeah, it's preparing for different worlds. It's what am I just totally missing? It's. If I had an extra eight hours every single day, what would I be spending that eight hours on? Um, and is that actually higher value use of my time than the thing I am spending that eight hours on today? Um, you know, it's like T Tim Ferriss actually has an incredible assortment of questions. He has this PDF that we can link in the show notes. I think it's like um, 17 questions that changed my life or something like that. That was long. I don't know if it still is, but for a while it was like a lead magnet um, for his newsletter. And I think that was what originally pulled me into it. But um, he's got a few in there. Like, what would I do if uh, I could only work two hours a week? That was an OG one from his um, from his four hour work week book. Uh, but he has a few like that that just force you to like scrub away some of the underlying um baseline assumptions that exist in how you operate uh, that are just really interesting as thinking prompts. It doesn't mean you're going to uh, fundamentally change any of those things, but forcing yourself to actually think about them and think creatively. Like if I could only work for an hour a day and I needed to make the same amount of money, what would I do and how would I do it? That's a good one. I also find whenever I go on a run or I do something where even like strength training doesn't work or riding a Peloton doesn't work because your phone is kind of there or possible to be there. But on a run, like you're forced to think because you can't, 
check your email while you're riding a bike. You can't pause in between sets and, you know, look at something. And I think I have my best ideas that are kind of abstract when I'm forced to do that. Now you could go on a walk and just leave your phone at home. You, you know, there's lots of ways to force it, but with running, I find that I just can't not think. It's the reason why the walk is the single most powerful habit that you can build. Um, there was a group of Stanford researchers who had participants uh, go on a walk versus not go on a walk and then take uh, this series of tests related to creative thinking. And what they found was that during and after the walk, the walkers experienced a 60% increase in creative divergent thinking versus the people that didn't walk. So walking literally sparked an incredible increase in their creative output and their in in their ability to think non-linearly, think creatively around their problems. So if you need any more of a reason to go for a daily walk and to actually get out of that headspace of being stuck in one place, that should be it. Yeah. And then last on the personal side, so we've gone down this path now of, you know, figuring out what we don't want to do, what we want to do, how we want to think different. Do you have a framework or a process for kind of focusing your time over, a, you know, to make sure you put these things into action? I'm a big fan of trying to have kind of like concentrated effort deployed. And I'm also a big fan of not creating upfront intimidation. So I developed something that I call the 30 for 30 approach, which is 30 minutes per day for 30 straight days. And the whole idea there is that if you're trying to improve at anything, if you're trying to instill a new habit, get better at something, get into shape, whatever the thing is, learn a new language, start improving your writing, uh, daily energy deployed into it in a focused manner is the best way to do that. The problem with that is if you try to commit to two hours a day to do something, you're just not going to do it. It's too much time. It's too intimidating up front. And so I've always found that 30 minutes, we can all find 30 minutes in our day, uh, no matter who you are. And I don't care if you say you're too busy. I know you can find 30 minutes in your day for something that you want to improve at. So 30 minutes per day. And then you just have to commit to doing that for 30 straight days. And it doesn't feel too intimidating at the outset, but 900 minutes of accumulated effort creates immense progress at the end of that period. People might look at you and say, gosh, Sahil's got all these Twitter followers and, and newsletter subscribers, but you started this kind of series where you, you know, got in a cold plunge and recorded it and posted on YouTube. And I remember when that came out, I was like, man, compared to how many reactions your tweets got, those views at the beginning were not, you know, anywhere close. No offense. Uh, no, no offense taken. It's true. <laughs> and you just kept going. And I was like, man. Sahil's got discipline. I, I was so impressed because I know so many people that if they had a large audience in one platform and they wanted to try something new and it wasn't taking off, would have abandoned ship five days in. Yeah, I find it oddly liberating not having an audience on a platform. Like I, I feel a certain pressure on a platform that you've grown large doing a specific thing that it's hard to do something new. And so like starting YouTube a few months ago, um, there was something that was just oddly refreshing about just being able to do whatever the hell I wanted. And if people didn't like it, that was okay. And I didn't really care what the views were on a video because I was just experimenting and having fun in a way that like, it's hard to experiment and have fun on a platform after you've grown it really large because there's this natural just feeling of like a pressure that comes with uh, delivering against the promise that you feel like you've made to people along the way. Yeah, I mean, I've launched a blog three times. It never worked. I've tried to use social media a bunch of times. It never worked. It, podcasting was the only thing that worked. And it was nice to be able to test that out over the years uh, and find out what actually works for me. Any tips for people that are kind of struggling in the, I don't know, 5, 10, 15 days into their 30 days? I mean, it's the same tip that I have for anything else in life, which is you are always just one good decision from being in a slightly better spot than you are today. And that applies to everything in life. Like no matter where you are, no matter how much of a rut you're in, no matter how dark the place is that you're currently in, all you need to think about is the one decision that is actually in front of you and not the hundreds that need to happen, not the thousands that need to happen. It's literally just the one decision that's going to put you in a slightly better spot tomorrow than where you are today. And if you can just change your mindset and focus on that one decision, 
everything really opens up to you. I love it. Okay, so that's covered a handful of tactics on yourself, things you could do on your own, push yourself. But we talked about early on that sometimes there are windows where spending time with family, spending time with your children, spending time with your friends, that is really kind of, you're in that prime season to do it. And, you know, we started a little bit on phones. So maybe we start a little bit with some of your face down phone theory and work into a few other things that you can do to intentionally spend time with others. Yeah. So these things that we hold in our pockets uh, constantly throughout the day uh, are useful for a variety of things, um, but devastating (laughs) for a variety of other things. And um, the tendency to have our phones between us and another human um, is one of the most damning tendencies. I said it earlier when I was talking about the anti-to-do list that having my phone out when I'm in front of my son is a habit that I'm constantly trying to crack because you think about what the other person is seeing if you're looking through their eyes. You've seen people do this to you. You're trying to have a conversation with them and they're like this. They're looking at their phone, right? Or they're like, you can tell their attention is pulled towards it. It has a huge impact on the level of connection that you feel. So there was a study that was done that showed just this. If you have your phone out on the table as you're having a conversation with someone, the feelings of connection between the two people are significantly diminished. Just having the phone out, not even being on it. So if I'm sitting here and we're doing this podcast and you see me kind of just like going like this, that level of connection that you and I have having a conversation is diminished just from having it out, not even on it. Obviously, if I'm sitting here texting while you're trying to talk to me, you feel that. So this is a reminder to all of us that those subtle signals in the same way that body language gives off these subtle signals, those subtle signals around the technology that we carry around with us are really impactful for how we interact with the people around us and for the levels of meaningful connection that we can develop. To me, what this means is that we just need to put our phones away more often. And by the way, I say all of this uh, with all humility in the world that I'm not some guru at this. I have my phone out way more than I should because a lot of my work is on my phone. And so I'm constantly fighting this tendency to have it out in front of me, to be checking things, to, to looking. Um, Cal Newport had this whole thing in deep work of like the just check. Um, you know, if you just check on something, it's pulling your attention away from whatever the more important task is that you're on. When that more important task is people that you're spending time with, when you're with your wife, when you're with your kid, when you're with your parents, your best friends, and you have that thing out in front of you, it creates a blockage in your ability to connect. Full stop. Yep. I see this all the time. One of the tactics you've used, and then I'll share one that I recently played with after this interview I did about making time, where one suggestion, which was aggressive, Jake was like, I just deleted all the apps on my phone. Like He even deleted Safari from his phone. No browser. His phone just is purely like the nothing phone, which now there, I guess there is a product for a couple hundred bucks. You can get a nothing phone. What do you do to not go that far, but still regain a little bit of your time? I mean, I like that. Yeah. I don't know. I have this friend named George Mack. I think he calls it his kale phone. And then his other phone is his cocaine phone. Uh, meaning like kale phone has no apps on it. It's like a stupid phone. And then cocaine phone is the one with all the dopamine hits and all of the apps and all of the stuff on it. Um, similar idea. I, um, I'm a big proponent of just like leaving my phone in another room uh, because I know that my lizard brain wants to grab it if it's anywhere near me. Um, and the, by the way, the phones are designed, the apps are designed by people who are trying to make it more addictive. Uh, Facebook has a team of PhD behavioral engineers, behavioral scientists, whose entire job is to figure out the colors and the sequences and the sounds, all of those things that will make it more addicting to you. So in order to fight back, you have to realize it's actually going to be really hard to fight that because they're playing on human urges and human needs. So only separating myself from it physically is what I found to work. So for me, it's like at a certain time of day, if we're going to be having dinner and cooking and having dinner sitting down as a family, my phone needs to be in another room. And again, I'm not 100% compliant with that when things are going on, but I'm pretty good about it now. Um, So I just think creating that physical separation is is the real key. What about grayscale mode? I've heard you say that you've experimented. Does that no longer work? Grayscale mode works great for removing the 
desire to just check on things. Grayscale mode for people who don't know is like a setting you can turn on your phone. I can triple click on the side and then it goes all gray. Yeah, I see that. It's funny because I, I wish I had two options. Mine, uh, triple click goes to red filter. Night. Yeah, a lot of people have told me about that red filter for night. I need to try that. Um, people say it helps with sleep. Um, that it's you, you're not getting all the what is it like the blue light yeah, at yeah. night or something. It makes me feel like I'll sleep better, but I don't have any data to support it. <laughs> no grayscale mode. I I mean I try to have my phone on grayscale mode about ninety percent of the day. The only times I don't have it on grayscale mode, or if I'm doing something image or video related where I actually need to see the colors, like if I'm, you know, doing something for Instagram or stories or whatever it might be. Um, but other than that, I would say it dramatically reduces your desire to be looking at your phone. If you turn off notifications so you don't have those little bubbles that are telling you that you haven't looked at anything, and if you turn your phone on grayscale mode, I would guess your phone usage will drop by 50% overnight. Yeah. So I, I was doing that. And then halfway between that and deleting all your apps, you know how you have these settings on your phone, do not disturb your personal, your sleep. I created one called no distractions. And you can go in, I didn't realize this was a thing. But you can say, hey, when I'm in this mode, hide all the app screens. So you lose your home screen, your home screen. At, like if you could see this photo, my home screen's blank. I've got nothing on my home screen when that mode is on. So for example, here's my phone without distraction mode. And then I swipe down and say, hey, put on no distraction mode. And now gone. Oh, geez, I need to do this. Where is this in the settings? If I go into settings right now, I'm going to go into focus. Okay. And on mine, it's called no distractions. And it says customize screens. And if you go in there and you say edit, you can uncheck all the screens that you want and say, I don't want to see any of the other screens. I just want the blank one. Oh. And now that mode for me is set up at 5 a.m. every morning until 9 p.m. That mode is on. And you can go in and also say what apps are allowed. And so silence all notifications. I have mine on only allow notifications from messages and phone. So I'll get texts and I'll get phone calls. Everything else is gone. So in no distraction mode, I will only get a text or a phone call and I won't see a single app on my phone. Oh, this is really cool. I need to set this up. This is great. Like my phone is basically becomes a dumb phone the entire time that mode is on. It's, it's awesome. This is great. So that's one for you right there. I love this. I'm going to set this up for sure. So sitting next to someone, we can put our phones away. We can put them in our pocket. We can turn on these modes. but just because you're still there doesn't mean you're as present as you could be. And you talk about these three levels of listening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the three levels of listening is a new model that I recently learned about that, to be honest, just like completely opened my eyes to a bunch of things that I was screwing up. I feel like, by the way, a lot of these things I talk about, um, there's this misconception that I'm talking about them because I'm like great at all these things. Uh, and I'm not. The reason I talk about them is actually because I'm struggling with them and trying to get better about it. And so it's me like in real time wrestling with this. And here's the thing that's helped me. The three levels of listening is one of those things recently, uh, because what I noticed was as a human, we have a tendency to default to what is called level one listening, which is me listening or, you know, putting putting quotes, me listening. You and I are having a conversation and the whole time you're talking. I am thinking about how everything you're saying is relating to me. So if you're talking about um, the run that you went on this morning and this beautiful path that you found, while I'm hearing that, what I'm actually doing is thinking about, oh, I should really go running today. I haven't run in a little while. Oh, maybe there's that path. Oh, I could tell him about this path. And so the whole time you're talking, I'm actually just thinking about myself and how the things you're saying are kind of relating to me. That's basically a form of conversational narcissism where anything the other person is saying is just being fed through a loop that's selfish, like an ego, egotistic bias, right? The two other levels of listening beyond that are where we need to start pushing the boundaries a bit more. So level two listening is you listening. Uh, that is when you're saying something and I'm actually listening to understand it. So I'm sitting here and as you're talking about that same run, I'm thinking about you really hearing how you're talking about the run and thinking about how you're enjoying running and these paths and the nature and how it's impacting your life and all of these other things. 
Level three is what's called us listening. That's thinking about what the other person is saying in the context of their broader world, like creating this map and understanding how it's impacting who they are and how it relates to the world around them and how that fits. It's like creating a more holistic picture of the other person in your mind. So the idea is like, if currently you're spending 90% of your time in that me listening level one, you need to start pushing a little bit more to spending more time as a level two and level three listener. And there's a personal reason for this in that it creates more feeling of connection and a greater feeling of understanding of the other people you're interacting with. There's also a very real professional reason for this, which is the most charismatic people in the world are not the most interesting. They're the most interested. They're the best listeners. They actually make you feel like you are the only person in the world when they're listening to you. They're really present. They're active listening and they're understanding what you're saying. So becoming a better listener, spending more time in level two and level three listening makes you more charismatic and makes you more interesting to other people that you're around. Is it as simple as just knowing this and doing it? I feel like just because I know that that's the default, this level one listening, thinking about me, are, do I need to be just hyper-focused on this? Or does this go back to the law of reversed effort where it's like, gosh, the more I'm focused on it, the harder it is to actually change? It's the same as any other uh, bad habit, right? Like awareness that a food is bad for you doesn't mean that you're never going to eat that food again. I still like pizza. I still want to have pizza now and then. But I'm aware that it's bad for me. So I'm probably going to have it a little bit less. The same exact thing applies to anything like this. So um, I'm now aware that level one listening is not the place where I want to live 90% of my life. I really want to try to listen to people to truly understand what they're saying. And so now when I find myself running off on some train of thought, thinking about myself and how what the person is saying relates to me, I can stop myself in real time because I'm aware of this idea that, oh, okay, wait, hang on. I'm not really listening right now. Let me just tune back in and just like really focus on what the person is saying. The goal is not to go from 90% in level one to zero. You're never going to do that. You're a human being. Um, we are naturally uh, egotistical. We need to protect ourselves. We ha- There's all sorts of reasons that you have that as a, uh, you know, sort of a cognitive bias in your mind, but we need to get a little bit better. So if you can go from 90% of the time in level one to 80% or to 70%, that can have a really dramatic impact on the feeling of connection in your relationships. And in a romantic relationship in particular, if you can default into more of an actually listening to understand versus just listening and waiting to talk, that makes a big difference. I mean, how many fights have you been in with a partner or with a spouse where you realize that you're just waiting your turn to talk rather than listening to truly understand what the problem is? That's a challenge. And then the other is, Sometimes the other person just wants you to listen. They don't want you to solve the problem. They, I find myself getting in, in, in relationship, trouble's the wrong word, but challenges when someone is, my wife, uh, talking, when my wife is talking about something and she wants me to understand where she's coming from, not to solve her problems. Uh, and so maybe if, if I were doing a little bit more deep listening that would come across because I, I I'm I'm listening to try to solve the problem but if that's not the end goal this is one of my favorite models for relationships when someone comes to you with a problem you ask do you want to be helped heard or hugged and it immediately cuts through the noise on that exact problem that you're identifying my natural bias is as a fixer like when my wife would come to me with a problem early in our relationship I would be like trying to think, okay, well, you could have done this differently. You could have done that. And she would go nuts. And it took me years to realize all she wanted was to be listened to. She wanted to be heard. And then maybe she wanted to be hugged because her love language is touch. So all I really needed to do in those moments was listen to her, hear her, and then give her a hug. But here I was spending all my time spinning my wheels, trying to fix whatever the problem was. And so it actually is like a really healthy way to identify what the other person needs from you in that moment. It's really, really helpful. Helped, heard, or hugged. Love that. I'm going to put a link in the show notes to a video. If you haven't seen it, I'll send it to you as well called It's Not About the Nail. And it is it is this perfect. uh, It's it's like a comedy video about uh, a husband trying to solve a problem that clearly doesn't need to be solved. It's very, very good. 
Yeah. So we talked about, you know, when you're with that other person, but what about who you're with? How important is it to spend time with the right people? <sighs> it's the difference between a good life and a bad life. There is scientific evidence that shows that the people that you surround yourself with, the people that create your environment are going to shape your outcomes and your reality. Um, there's a scientific effect called the Pygmalion effect, which says that we rise to the level of others' expectations for us or we fall to that level of expectations. So if you surround yourself with people who are encouraging you to think bigger, who believe in you, who are pushing you that you're capable of more than you're currently doing, you will naturally rise to that level of expectations. You will improve yourself. Similarly, on the dark side of that, if you're surrounded by people who are telling you to be realistic, who are laughing at your ambitions, who are telling you you're not capable, you will fall to the level of those expectations. So finding your way into those rooms, creating those communities, surrounding yourself with people who are embracing the fact that you have a dynamic potential as a human being can completely change your life. And what are some tactics to try and find those people or, or create more people that are high energy for you? I think it's finding the little micro communities where people are truly supporting each other. Um, I mean, I have found enormous success in finding new friends in this season of my life um, that have been based around the kind of like fitness and wellness community. Um, as a group, People that are into their health, into running, into lifting, naturally, those type of people believe and have a growth mindset and they want to support other people in that same thing. And so I've just found that that is like a filtering mechanism for me in my own life of finding people who um, are naturally positive, who are naturally optimistic, who naturally believe that the future can be better than the present. Um, so finding those spaces for you, putting yourself into an environment where the people's values are going to be similar to yours, I think that that is really the recipe for finding that community, finding that group. And what about people that aren't that? What about people who complain a lot or make you feel frustrated about yourself when you spend time with them? I think you need to slowly remove those type of people from your life. And this goes back, by the way, we're going to come full circle. This goes back to what I said at the beginning, that time and energy are not the same. It's easy to say, oh, cut the people out of your life. You can't always do that. Um, if it's a family member, if it's a parent, if it's a spouse, if it's a kid, whatever, if it's a best friend, you can't just full, full cut people out of your life always. It's hard. But you can reduce the amount of energy that you're giving those people. And so if I have to be around someone, say at some family dinner or Thanksgiving dinner, and they're really negative, and I know that they have an ability to cut me um, by saying certain things, by making, you know, poking fun, whatever it might be, I'm not going to open up to that person. I'm not going to give them my energy in the way that I used to. And that is an effective way of cutting them out that doesn't actually require me saying, hey, I'm cutting you out of my life and trying to have that kind of crazy cutoff before and after with a person. Sometimes cutting people out is necessary and you actually need to do that. But what I have found is that it's generally uh, a much more manageable change to make to just say, I'm not going to open my energy up to this person. I'm not going to allow them to have that impact on me that they've had in the past. Yeah. Are there other places where you've found people that have that same attitude? I mean, you've mentioned that most people don't want you to succeed. Where do you find people that do? It's a good question. I mean, I think that um, one of the big ones for me is finding people that have kind of aligned values or interests. Um, and m one macro value that I have in life is just around delayed gratification. And it's why I keep talking about fitness or why I talk about health in general is because that is a filtering mechanism for people who believe in delayed gratification. You're doing something hard now for some sort of benefit later. I think you can find whatever your core values are in the world, people that are excited about those same things. Um, look, I mean, people that are really into dogs and being outdoors, like optimistic, generally happy people going to a dog park or a brewery that's outside. You're going to find a lot of people that are generally happy, that are outside, that are active, um, 
So I think this all comes down to just putting yourself into an environment that already has filtered for the type of people that you want to be around. Yeah. I think uh, also thinking about people who are willing to put in time to try to find those people. So I wonder if professional groups, whether it's like YPO or what Sam launched with Hampton, where it's like people are specifically spending money and time to try to find groups of other people that they can work with, not professionally, but more like emotionally and socially, who are all have similar professional ambitions. Yeah. And it's, again, it's people that are paying money because they're trying to get better at something. They're wanting to improve. They're needing that you know space to actually uh, improve themselves over periods of time. So again, you've self-selected. It's a signaling mechanism for a whole set of values that that person has about their life. And it comes down to the ability and willingness to grow and to want to change and to want to do hard things now to experience a benefit later. Love it. As we wrap, something that applies to both personal and social and really life in general, talk about your number one rule in life. My most important rule for life, don't complain about anything. Because when you complain about something, you are just giving too much energy to it. You're giving too much power to that thing. And the way to reassume that power is to not allow it to command your mind. If you can affect the thing, if you have the power to actually change it, go do something about it. And if not, you're just giving too much energy spending time thinking about it. So move on to something that you can actually affect. Yeah, I, I've since hearing that I have tried to adopt it and catch myself anytime I complain. I'm like, why can I fix this? If I can't fix it, why complain? It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's the, and it's stress. It's complaint. I mean, it's like it's the same thing, right? If I'm not, if I can't change it, I can't impact it in any way. I'm not going to stress about it. And like everything else, I'm not saying I'm perfect about this, and I constantly need the reminder in my own head. Um, but not complaining really will change your life. Yeah, my my sub rule that I won't put number one that we keep. I keep coming back to don't complain and don't ask someone for help if you haven't spent 15 minutes trying to solve the problem yourself. Um, it's a, a lesson I learned from a guy named Hristo who works on the Tim Ferriss show. And he's, he one time told me he was trying to figure something out. And I was like, let me know if you need help. He's like, I haven't spent 15 minutes trying to solve this. So I don't want to waste your time. And I was like, if everyone adopted that rule, don't complain. What a world we would live in. That's so true. Then I guess the final thing is, what do you think someone gets from being more intentional with their time? Time is your most precious asset. And like in your prior episode where you were talking about making more time, what we talked about a lot today is not making more of it, but using it more intentionally. When you use your time more intentionally, you get better outcomes. It's like, you know, you're investing that time in something that has a higher ROI to use, you know, a technical term. And so everything that we're talking about, that doesn't mean you're making more money with your time, but it means you're using it more intentionally where you're going to experience higher benefits than you would have otherwise. And that applies to all of these areas. It might be productive time where you're pushing and working on things. It might be solitude where you're just creating space, where you're slowing down, where you're going for walks. It might be intentional listening where you're with people and you're really thinking about what's the best way to create these feelings of connection and to develop these relationships of love and support. All of those things create better outcomes on the same one unit of time. Well said. One of the things that you've been spending a lot of your time on the past few years um, that I'm actually really excited about is this new book. And I just want to touch on it. It's not out yet. People can't read it, but you can pre-order it. What have you spent so much time trying to articulate and, and why did you write the book? Really, I've been trying to articulate a different way to think about your life, a different way to measure what matters in your life, to make better decisions, to define your own priorities uh, around the pillars that really create lasting joy and fulfillment. And I think of it as a new model, a new way to think about designing your world, designing your life. And I'm so excited to just have it in the world and to see people um, actually interact with it. It's really built around questions versus answers. And so start asking themselves these questions that will prompt discussion with those around them, will prompt life changes that I think will dramatically impact people. Uh, and I'm just so excited to finally be able to talk about it and to have it out there in the world. It's called The Five Types of Wealth. You can pre-order it wherever books are sold. There's some cool perks if you buy a couple extra copies. 
we uh we bought 10 copies so we're gonna have you back uh within the all the hacks membership to do a little q a on the book down the road and, and we'll probably do an episode on the book as well this has been great any other parting things before we take off go for more walks that's my number one thing for uh more intentionally using your time uh a walk is like the single greatest habit you can build 15 minutes a day change your life love it Sahil, thanks for being here thank you